Okay, fantastic. So welcome to the very first Urban Design Group Student Awards presentation. My name is Alan Thompson. I'm the co-chair of the National Urban Design Awards. Oh, and I know that it's hard to believe, but once upon a time, very long time ago, I too was a student. I studied urban design at IUAV and Diest at the University of Venice, and that was nearly 30 years ago. Urban design has changed a lot during that time. Uh, there seems to be far more bicycles and significantly less gondolas, as far as I can see. So anyhow, since then, I've come to understand that there is no right way to be an urban designer. In fact, there are very many equally valid ways of approaching our discipline. Um, this will be convincingly demonstrated by the work that we're going to see today and again next week. Um, but having said this, there are plenty of wrong ways to be an urban designer. And I'm hoping that your tutors have tipped you off about all of this stuff already. So we don't need to worry about that. Urban design has, has had a pretty checkered past. Um, we did unspeakable things last century um, and on an industrial scale. Um, we're rightly ashamed of that legacy. And now we're striving for the very best practice in urban design. Um, clearly, people are at the centre of good urban design, and that's why UDG calls our programme people-friendly places. Um, so at very least, the public are expecting us to do no more damage to their towns and cities. Of course, we can do much better than that. We are fully capable of bringing delightful, prosperous, sustainable new places into the world. The Urban Design Group is committed to this mission, and we seek to uncover best practice, share it and promote it. We are champions of good design, and that's what we're doing here today. Francis Tibbold, who co-founded the UDG in the far distant past when there were less bikes and more gondolas. Um, Francis was an absolute champion of good design. His generous bequeath um, has supported the Student Award for many years. He would be proud to see the ongoing work the UDG is doing in promoting the next generation of designers. And a little quick plug here. Um, please come join us um, and help us champion good design. We welcome your ideas. We welcome your advice. We want you to get. We want to get to know you, and we want um, to help you get to know each other. So please sign up. Uh, you are absolutely one hundred percent welcome at UDG. Um, so what we're doing here today. Last year we provided a platform um, for shortlisted professional practices to share their work to a much larger audience. This year, it's your turn. You're at the very, very beginning of your career. Um, you really need exposure. You really need celebration. Um, far, far more than us old timers. Okay. So today, we're looking at four master plan projects. We have another session um, next week on conceptual design on Thursday, 23rd of March. Please join us again for that. Just a quick note um, to our, our commended student presenters. Put simply, you are here today because your work is outstanding. It demonstrates that a new generation can not only be fully committed to doing no harm, they can also be dedicated to producing wonderful, joyful, people-friendly places. Um, I really have to say it, congratulations. We're here to celebrate you. We commend all the talent and dedication required um, that's helped you arrive here today. We really do. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joseph Plant to share his presentation. And Joseph is from Oxford Brooks University, and he's presenting a scheme called Osney Mead, a place for all. Hello, so I'm Joseph, as you know, um, a graduate of the MA in Urban Design at Oxford Brooks. Firstly, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, this is a small mass plan I produced for a three hectare site in the West End of Oxford, um, as part of a wide proposal for a selection of sites, including Oxpens and Osney Mead sites. Um, my vision for the site, a place for all, came from a visit to the quarter, following discussions with members of Oxford relating to the challenges of regenerating an active industrial area that's mostly university owned and is therefore threatened in terms of public interest with the potential to become a campus comprised only of student accommodation, labs and enclosed public spaces with little incentive to become a destination for visitors or locals alike. These concerns are exacerbated from the site being physically detached from the city centre by train lines, the Thames and various small streams, both causing a flood risk and causing this part of the city to slip out of collective consciousness. The site is uniquely situated, both in close proximity to Westgate Shopping Centre and part of the Oxford Greenbelt, comprising a range of units mostly constructed 80 to 40 years ago, with some reflecting previous uses within the rail industry. 
I then for selected a smaller piece of our wider master plan, which demonstrated the, uh, a good test area for the vision and was chosen because it could be an ideal focal space for the wider plan with views over Castle Mill Stream toward the site of Osney Abbey, while also having suitable warehouse units which could be repurposed, reflecting the varied site history and preserving embodied carbon. Developing the vision and the brief set by Oxford and the City Council as part of my course, the layout was created with four objectives in mind. A strong identity that would reconnect the sites to its history and provide a build form that creates lasting memories, reconnecting the area to the new picture of Oxford and adding positively to the famous dreaming spires. Like any new development, a drainage strategy was a, a key part of the brief. However, in the context of the high flood risk present, my objective to respond to the changing climate evolved into providing space for nature first. And finally, to tru truly function as part of a rapidly growing centre of innovation, the site needs to be safe for both residents and those passing through, which equally meant that the mix of uses must be diverse to support the wide range of expectations from a wide range of users that such an important development as this attracts. The proposal itself is just three small residential blocks fitting into the 3.2 hectare parcel with a mix of uses facing a public square connecting to Osney Island via a regenerated bridge. To support the objective of a diverse scheme, a high density of 60 dwelling pe dwellings per hectare was proposed, utilising predominantly flats, reflecting the dense city centre area type, or fitting into the rural edge by creating positive views towards Boars Hill through the use of green roofs. The addition of townhouse style units with private gardens and 15 live work units fronting the main route created a variety in the street scene, which was further achievable by reducing car infrastructure and across the proposal, narrowing streets by also utilizing a number of privacy innovations, focusing on one and two bed units to best reflect the demands on affordability that this part of the city currently faces. The addition of the live work units sought to activate frontages where demand could not support commercial uses across the whole scheme due to local competition, with the proposal of the shared workspaces intending to allow continued incubation of existing employers on the site. The block form was constructed first from sorry, the block form was constructed first from the movement routes incorporating where possible the existing buildings, providing a visual link to the site's heritage. The, the block form was then split into plots, which was inspired by the Victorian terraces found across Castle Mill Stream to the north. Maps, maximum height of the development is set at 18.2 metres by Carfax Tower, with the only proposed exception to this rule being the proposed landmark building at the square, which will replicate the visual cue that Osney Abbey, had it been retained, might have produced. A mix of mono pitch and shared gables are used to minimise visual distinction between flats, townhouses and coach houses and to create increased cohesion across the site. A philosophy extended to tenure blind affordable housing at 50% of this proposal, which was also set in the local plan. Likewise, I created more personal streets by creating narrowing and overhanging facades and by partially opening out spaces previously within industrial units, which was inspired by the success of similar spaces within the Pateworks development of Bristol, which some of you may know. This variety in space created intrigue as you walk through the proposal, increasing the perceived transition between spaces. When designing the street layout, I deliberately positioned sensory elements in conjunction with the serial vision approach taken to designing the spaces. Here I combined sensory experience with a bit significant visual element. For example, by point one, increasing sensory planting in a more enclosed area or towards number four, adding a unit which could be appropriate to be a coffee shop, which would then coincide with a key deflection of a vista. This all aimed to create a more memorable experience. Achieving a target density, an innovative approach to, to um, 
using the, sh the garden spaces. To do this, I used shared gardens on podiums, which would be above the service uses, as you can see here. This served a variety of functions. First, reducing parked cars' impacts on the street scene or removing cars from them. Visually disguising service access, service access for commercial units when they are facing the square and on the main pedestrian route, and also creating meeting places that's restricted to residents, allowing for the development of a more cohesive community and also providing space for urban food production, which is extended in the provision of a green wall, which also serves to block overlooking into private gardens for the townhouses. My proposed flat typology combined with live work units allowed the uses of fronts to be considered to complement a privacy gradient while only minimally increasing circulation space proportional, proportional to the number of units and provide the desired 30% transparent frontage on the primary streets as also required in the local plan. This was also done so that I could provide a front door to each dwelling up to the third floor inclusive, which would also allow residents to take greater stewardship over pavement spaces, which was further enhanced by providing the movable plants as you see here and variation in floor materials at setbacks. For the lower order streets further down the privacy gradient, I met the increased demand for a family housing demographic by using townhouses, which would have private and a combination shared garden, which in this instance featured angled front, front windows and door screens to increase the privacy given the shorter front to front distances. The central square was created at the confluence of existing pedestrian movement routes, preserving existing memory. The mobility strategy focused primarily on micro mobility first which was achieved by creating areas that minimise the influence of the car within the site. The bridge to Osney Island that you see at the north is pedestrianised and would only allow access for emergency vehicles, which was supported by reducing the cars from the centre of the blocks and was possible only thanks to the local plan requiring just 0.2 parking spaces per dwelling if provided within a car share scheme. Other than that, visitor parking would be available on the outside of the blocks on the main vehicular routes. The same approach was taken to connecting movement paths, which was connecting patches of, um, sorry, the same approach to connecting movement paths was taken to connecting patches of nature, which you can see here through the ecological link down the wider streets from the river edge spaces, which would also serve to flood Vermont. Joseph, you have about two minutes. Thanks. Similarly, rather than create a hard landscape edge, you've seen that I created, a, while avoiding the busy towpath edge, I, which could support a frontage of shops, I needed to minimise the effect of the Thames flooding, so I created a biodiverse landscape habitat, which should be viewed as an opportunity to increase biodiversity, public contact with nature, which could be achieved through proposed boardwalks, which could also includes signs highlighting current issues with pollution, which prohibit wild swimming at this and other locations across the city. I took a 330-300 approach to creating green, spe green spaces as a response to the issue within Oxford, that despite it having one of the highest green coverage rates of any UK city centre, a vast majority of this is contained with the existing quads or private gardens, which therefore creates a payment barrier for non-students to access green spaces within walking distance of many of the employment centres, which demonstrates, again, the need for me to develop this site for all. This approach meant that three trees would be visible from all front doors, 30% of the site would be green, and nowhere would be more than 300 metres from the green space, which, as I mentioned, was contained um, within that main square. This combined with the proposed sustainable urban drainage system, which included green roofs, would also meet the objective in the brief to greatly re-green the long distance views across to the city centre, replacing the existing industrial site. As developments are increasingly considering the benefits to mental and physical health after heightened awareness during the pandemic, my hope was that this vision of replacing car-dominated streets with nature-centred and connected spaces to create destinations which form long-lasting positive memories 
could be extended to the rest of the redevelopment of the West End of Oxford. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to present this proposal. Um, I hope it was interesting considering some of the um, methods I've used to meet the objectives. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Joseph. Sarench, could you try to yeah. load yeah, hey, up? And while you are, I'm going to introduce you. You're Saranch, um, forgive me if you, I don't get your name fully correct, Call Shrestha? Is that? Yeah, is that that's Saranch. Saranch. Yes. Okay, tremendous. Um, and you're from the University of Dundee, and your scheme is revitalising a diminishing town. So, um, which is actually yeah. a very different approach, as I said in the beginning. It's, it's so interesting to see the way in which individual students are approaching these projects so differently, and the schools are approaching them too. And it's fully, fully acceptable and legitimate to do that. It's, um, it's the kind of profession that we are. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll now yeah. share my screen then. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Yes, tremendous. Please do. Thank you. Yeah. I hope you can see my presentation. Yep. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Ten minutes. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Saranj Kulshesh, and my I, uh, my uh, I am a student of MSc Special Planning with Sustainable Urban Design at University of Dundee. Uh, the title of my project uh, a competition for for this competition is revitalizing a diminishing town center, which I submitted as a part of my uh, submission for the urban design module. I'll be starting my presentation with a brief introduction of the town that I'm going to work upon. Then I'll move ahead to describe my problem statement and the aim that I derive from it. Further going ahead, I'll give a brief analysis to give to pick some clues from and propose a viable solutions based on those. Uh, the overall approach for my project is to use Blagori and Rattery as an urban laboratory test, test case to implement a 20 minute neighborhood approach. This could further be applied in comparable, comparable settlement locations elsewhere in Scotland to align with the policies mentioned in NPF4. The town that I'm working on is called Blagory, which is the largest town in the Perth and Kindross Council. It falls in an economically fragile zone, and thus it has been identified as a priority for action uh, by the council. The first map on the left shows the boundaries of the Perth and Kindross Council, and the town lies on the eastern edge of it. The second and third maps focus on the travel times by car and bus respect respectively to nearby important towns and cities like Perth and Dundee, which are almost 20, 30 minutes away. Looking at the actual boundaries of the Gregory and Rattery town, we have this map telling us how these two towns are located uh, next to each other and connected by an, a single bridge, which in turn connects their economies and, uh, to major highways like A93, A923 and A926 run through these towns, linking them to Perth, Dundee, Cooper and Gus respectively. Our focus for the context of this presentation will be on Gregory, which has been identified by the BRDT as a historic market town, with tourism being its main economic lifeline, where long riverside walks, salmon trout fishing are some of the main economic, and one of the many attractions, few of the many attractions. It is also referred as a soft food, food capital of uh, Scotland because of the local berry production that happens here. As of now, Blairgarry has become majorly a commuter town and a part employment destinations with more workers commuting out of Blairgarry, mainly to Dundee and Perth, than to it for work. Now, this brings me to my problem statement, which is how can a place with so much natural beauty around it, with so much culture and heritage engraved into it, housing a variety of businesses like retail, leisure, financial and services, simplified by different colors on the map, with almost 43% of commuters, consumer spending going towards social dining and local food and beverages industry, along with a good concentration of popular tourist attractions that bring a large number of users from different age groups to this area. And after being even identified under a historical conservation area by the Perth and Kinos Council, we still be the most deprived town as per the SMAD data. This means that something has gone terribly wrong in how Gregory Town Center is being used. And we need a functional rethinking and a change of approach to bring, give it back its lost significance. So this gives me enough base to establish an aim, which is to revitalize Bregory's town center by carefully crafting its streets and public realm into a multifunctional pedestrian precinct in order to preserve its economic significance, cultural identity, and historical character. 
Some of the focus areas for me will be environment, heritage, durability, abundant economy, local facilities, and commercial attractiveness. Before moving to any of the solutions, we have to first analyze what has worked for Blair Gauri in the past. So for this, we can pick up clues from the town center from the town center's history, where the street spaces and buildings were designed to be more empathetic towards pedestrians' experience. The sensitivity to this human scale can be seen on the town in the town center's layout, which has a good legibility and permeability, allowing it to um, allowing them to move very comfortably through this through, through its streets. Also, looking at the figure ground map, uh, clearly the proportion of built to unbuilt spaces more in favor of uh, open spaces. There are some clues that can be drawn from the latest community directory and Blagory and directory community action plan, uh, which which have certain uh, visions relating to local economy, tourism, environment, heritage, health, and community. And these will act as main priorities for me also, and and I'll try to cater them cater the demands of these. Coming to the actual site, I'll try to first establish the actual sites, the site context. This is an aerial view of the historical town center, where the triangular area is called Well Meadow acts as an entry point for the town, with some important building and facilities located around the town centers, like a school, library, church, bank, cemetery, police station, care homes, bus stands, etc. These are some of the major roads that run through this town, uh, and we have the bridge that connects across uh, the river Ish to Rattree. Gas Bray and Perth Road connect the town to Dundee and Perth. William Street connects Perth Road with Gasprey. This is a terrain map that tells us that a major part of this town center is located at a comparatively gentle slope and the steepness increases as we move more towards the north. This is the traffic across Blegory town center where the maroon line symbolizes vehicular traffic while the blue line symbolizes pedestrian circulation traffic, uh, pedestrian circulation. Uh, from this diagram, it can be seen that the streets are quite narrow, thus mixing of uh, pedestrian and vehicular traffic leads to many choke points and congestion on the streets. My, 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 my proposal is to resolve this by limiting the flow of traffic from entering into the town center through Well Meadow, making it majorly a pedestrian friendly zone and redirect, redirecting the vehicles through other major roads. This will include measures like erection of modal filters at selected locations that restrict the motor vehicles from passing through the Well Meadow onto high street. To put this in comparison with the original, the left, the diagram on the left is the original, is the current scenario, and the diagram on the right is the proposed scenario. Strategy, strategically locating parking areas at selected locations and managing parking times on these roads can help resolve any result in parking demands. This leads me uh, to uh, this opens up, this personalization opens up us to a lot of opportunities. Some of them can be town center enhancement, active travel, local economy, and the community development. With, and the priorities for this can be linked back to the community action plan that I mentioned earlier. This is an over, over, overall map of the uh, of the scheme with the pedestrianized streets uh, indicated in green dotted lines. As part of the overall traffic flow and parking strategy, the red lines symbolize the major vehicular traffic roads. Brown lines stand for in for two-way internal streets, and blue and blue stand for one-way streets. The pinks are the pro the proposed parking existing and proposed parking provisions that are there in the town. Based on the strategy that I mentioned above, I will now take you through a visual sequence numbered here to depict what these pedestrian streets could feel like. This is a view of the Well Meadow Street, looking at its entrance from Gas Bray. The street looks very dull with not much attention given to the pedestrian or a cyclist experience. Road safety can be an issue, especially with no provision for pedestrian crossing. The footpaths are quite narrow and do not terminate properly. In my proposal, I suggest a, the complete pedestrianization of the whole street with active street frontages and active street design by benefiting people uh, who are walking, cycling, and using wheelchairs. This will contribute towards active travel, tourism, recreation, and carbon reduction. A welcoming entrance to the town, an enhancement and restoration of the local buildings can contribute towards the heritage and identity of the town. Introduction of street furniture and greening measures to elevate and look and feel of the street, allowing street vendors and local shops to, to use the street using flower displays as act for an active uh, shop frontages can help boosting the local economy. You have around two minutes. This is another view. This is a view of the Croft Lane looking at Allen Street. 
it's a very thin sheet and feels very claustrophobic, unsafe, and limited to question and cyclist. To bring it back to life, my proposal suggests changing the street surface material, uh, adding paving blocks, adding green patches, appropriate uh, appropriate locations, introduction of innovative and uh, decorative lighting measures to make it more safe and interesting, use it flower displays to make the street more engaging. These interventions will contribute towards active lifestyle, tourism, town design, recreation, environment, and more feeling of community. This is my third proposal, which is more of a placemaking. We can add some, this is a junction between Croft, Croft Lane and Perth Street. We can have interesting lighting, comfortable seating, wayfinding synergies at, uh, indicating towards places of interest, artworks that depict culture and heritage of the town, flower displays, and improved street furniture and bins. The look and feel of this junction will definitely change with this, contributing towards tourism, heritage, recreation, environment, town design, just to name a few. This is a view of the high street, which is now dominated more or less by less by pedestrians and more by cars. Uh, the traffic speed is quite high on this, and this makes it very unsafe for cyclists and pedestrians uh, with the, these heavy vehicles. The road has very interesting and beautiful buildings, but there's no fr not enough frontage to look at these and appreciate their beauty. So my proposal will allow, allow a complete motor vehicle ban on this section of the road, only on this section of the road. We'll have paving that is compatible for cycling and walking to be introduced, proper decorative lighting, along with street greening measures, place making interventions at residual spaces, street shops and local vendors, to contributing towards travel, tourism, heritage, recreation, environment, economy, and the feeling of community again. This brings me to my last view, which is that of Kirkman. This leads us all the way to the north, where we connect with the primary school or a care home. Despite having these facilities, there's not, not even a single provision of pedestrianization for of footpath here, making it very unsafe for, uh, for users, uh, cyclists and pedestrians both. The road is at a very steep slope, but, uh, so the, but does offer a very good views. But the lack of station points where person can stand and appreciate this beauty are very are, are none, next to none. So this can be changed by reserving the street for pedestrian and cyclists, improving the quality of surface and lighting street greening at locations, locating strategic points of view, adding railings and wall surfaces to help pedestrians move up the, up the steep slope. So with this inter intervention, I'll be able to capture the following features that are uh, in that are mentioned in the 20 minute neighborhood. But at the same time, I'll be able to capture certain sustainability aspects, which are like surface water absorption from the green patches that I've introduced, reduced reflection of heat. There's also the local production and consumption cycle that will be able to cater because of the local economy. And it, it, it will become more of an inclusive uh, place. So that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Tremendous. Thanks, Suraj. <clears throat> so Raghav um, Ajmer is from University of Manchester, and he's going to be sharing a project um, called Trafford Wharfside. Um, there it is. Excellent. We can see it, kind of. Maybe you want to make it full screen. Could be, could be useful. That's it. You go. Sorry. Off you go. Tremendous. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Raghav Ajmera, and today I shall be presenting one of my academic projects from Master Planning Module. So just like puzzle, each, each piece or part of a city has its own character and is unique, yet uh, they are all interconnected and play a key role in completing the puzzle of the city. And if one looks at the heart of Greater Manchester, some key pieces are visible quite distinctively. And these pieces are not just uh, recognized nationally, but have international presence too. Landmarks such as Old Trafford, Langshaw Cricket Stadium, Imperial War Museum have annual footfall in millions. But if you look closely, all these distinctive pieces are disconnected and there's a key piece missing from the puzzle. And that's Trafford Wharfside. Located along the Manchester Ship Canal, north of Old Trafford Stadium, south of Salford Keys, a gateway to the Trafford Park from Manchester. But what does this piece look like? In order to study the site further, contextual analysis at different scales was done and compiled as a strategic master plan framework. Uh, this was done as part of a group work. Uh, certain major issues were identified through analysis 
just uh, such as uh, dull built forms with poor frontages, car dominated landscapes, lack of public spaces, loss of heritage assets, uh, low permeability and restricted accesses, um, noise pollution, etc. And all these blight the site, creating harsh edge conditions and undermine the human experience. The site has some key potentials to offer to. It has unparalleled views of Old Trafford, despite uh, the visual landscape being overpowered by wide busy road. And on the opposite side, it offers key views of canal. And uh, in future, it shall uh, offer views to the proposed developments along the keys. But overall, the tram line and the canal itself acts as a major barrier to movement, uh, to the north-south movement. The mass day transforms the landscape of the wharf site completely with huge amount of crowd movement from car parks and tram stops. Uh, several informal kiosks and stalls pop up on the footpaths to serve the crowd. Uh, also, the route from tram stop to Trafford Civico has been considered by local policymakers as a key movement corridor where sustainable modes should be increased. So, how do we fit, fit these pieces to complete the uh, puzzle of Greater Manchester? Currently, the site is dominated by warehouses, office blocks, and surface car parks. But there are some existing structures, such as Victoria Warehouse, which are not great listed, but are of heritage value as they represent uh, the rich industrial history of offsite and add a distinctive character to it. The pedestrian experience and safety along high activity areas uh, should be improved along with the development of new pedestrian bridge to improve connectivity and make the canal no longer as a beginning. New commercial and residential districts would uh, integrate the character of the surrounding and upcoming neighborhoods. A public park would deliver area scale green infrastructure, which would be integrated with the existing network. These new districts would be facilitated by public spaces of different hierarchies and interconnected by pedestrian networks uh, and overlooked by terraces and active frontages. And these spaces would preserve and further enhance the key views of the surrounding context and introducing landmark structures at key points would create uh, strategic gateways and improve uh, the legibility further. The proposed master plan is an amalgamation of all these ideas and is contextually driven through analysis and policies of the local planning documents. A new residential community would act as a catalyst for future residential developments in the surrounding context. It would be served by a new primary school, local GP, allotment land and community center. Other than that, there shall be a multi-level car park in the commercial district towards the extreme west of the site, uh, dedicated for the stadium and the war museum. The pedestrian routes through the site increase the walkability and act as a part of the green infrastructure network. The existing bus stops and metro stations have, have also been integrated in the design. And also the existing metro line alignment is modified and integrated with the pedestrian street. During mass days, a certain stretch of road shall be pedestrianized to create an uninterrupted flow of pedestrian activity uh, in and around the tram stop. The wharf side way has been transformed into a multimodal street. The building along it has been uh, provided with significant setback in order to uh, incorporate a green buffer and white footpaths for ease of movement during mass days. The proposal offers different hierarchy of public spaces, each having a different use and serving different user groups. Uh, these spaces strengthen the existing public realm network and further promote pedestrian activities in and around the site. The Wharf Site Park shall act as an important public realm for the local residents as well as integral part of the public realm network. Uh, it shall compensate for the lack of green infrastructure in the 15-minute walk of the site and would provide spaces for people of all ages. 
the lush green with a uh, offside park and the active edge along it would draw a uh, pedestrians from keys towards the stadium uh, the new landmark tower located on its end shall blend in with the future developments along the key side and further improve the legibility of the area uh, also the proposed development uh, would not dominate the view to the old trafford stadium and would enhance and uh, uh, would further enhance it the united plaza links the tram stop to the old trafford stadium uh, it would provide spaces for optional activities such as spillover spaces and uh, dedicated zones for informal market during match days the buildings around it have a, have semi public green roof terraces providing overlooking and a sense of comfortable enclosure the united plaza acts as a gateway to the old trafford stadium it further enhances its grandeur and welcomes the spectators to the theater of dreams the proposal acts as an extension of the surrounding character areas and respects uh, their architecture distinctiveness and features uh, the high density commercial district in the west blends with the existing nature of the trafford park paving way for future developments uh, and around the site similarly the wharfside park acts as an extension of the public realm and retail character of the salford keys the leisure district uh, respects the heritage architectural style of existing structures and serves the tourist activities of the surrounding context i give you 2 minutes yeah so to conclude the proposed development on trafford wharf site uh, would be rooted in its area's context and driven by a sense of future it would capitalize on its location and heritage assets uh, improve the landscape character uh established strategic gateway and enhance the mass day experience through use of different urban design elements and hence it shall complete the puzzle of greater manchester thank you if you could um stop sharing your screen and then we can ask um lao wen ham that's it yeah looks good okay hello i'm wen liao I'm very glad here to give this presentation. My topic is healthy neighborhood. Firstly, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of the site. The site is located near the Manchester city centre, within five minutes walk to the Piccadilly station, which provides a convenient connection to regional areas, but also contributes international travel to London. Once the HS2 is completed, the site will benefit from it as well. The site has a strategic link to some key destination in Manchester such as the town hall, Adel Centre and Piccadilly station which are all the factors that should not be ignored. Historical analysis is a key step in helping me understanding the growth and evolution of the site, figure out the history of building, uh, sorry. figure out the history of building within the site and know about the residents sense of identity i found that the site once was used for industries and workers living uh, with the construction of birmingham london railway line the site crossed in the middle by a viaduct in the 1980s the site changed dramatically due to the construction of a motorway a um, municipal way to the south of the site and the construction of new street and new building Uh, the most important and impressive historical building and structure is the Sackville Street building. GI and public realm are the factors that affect health. I analyzed the GI and public realm around the site and found that there are many GI adjacent to the site and some protectional public realms to the west and east. From the development policy we can see that there are three surrounding areas that already planted the circle square to the west and the mayfield and hs2 manchester piccadilly to the east this development policies are important factors in my design consideration uh, from the connectivity and site analysis i found that the site is a key path to connect the uh, oxford road area to the city centre and the future development area to the east and west 
though the site is uh, well connected by vehicles and public transport, the road within the site is short, not clear, poor in legibility, and not well connected. Uh, several busy roads impede people from Oxford Road and Mayfield. Poor legibility, low quality meals and buildings, pollution of noise, lack of active frontage and walkable roads are all the problems in the site. So to create a healthy neighborhood, I took several actions. This is my design layer. <clears throat> First, for connectivity, I designed four new east-west streets to enhance the site's connectivity uh, to connect the Circle Square and the Mayfield. The first street is this, this street. This street is Sackville Shared Street, which provides easier access to Vimpton Park and attracts travelers from Piccadilly Station. Um, it's a green shared stream with dedicated cycle lineways, uh, which encourage low carbon travel. The second street is this street, Rail, uh, Railway High Street, where I activate the street with railway arches and uh, the second floor retail. This is a green pedestrian road where events happen. This street also linked to the potential public realm to attract full force from Circle Square to uh, Mayfield area. The third street is actually a service street, which provides better access to the site for service vehicles while relieving traffic pressure in the east-west direction. The last one is also a shared street that many use for students, pedestrians, and enhancing the connection between uh, the western and the eastern area. <clears throat> Secondly, um, for the GI and public realm, most of the GI and public realm on the site are transformed from the original uh, foundation of the site. The first one is North Gateway. <clears throat> North Gateway, I, I create a legible gateway to connect to the city center. I use the ground floor of the Sackville Street building to create a, a, an active frontage to attract footfalls. Next one is Vimpton Park. I removed the car park here and enlarged the original park, enhancing its accessibility and interactivity. I also place interactive facility for users uh, for use by different groups of people, provides plots of land for people to move around and improve biodiversity. Bicycle lines are provided to the north and the south of the park. Then uh, if you walk down the street, uh, you will arrive at Century Plaza. It's a large hot square with interactive fountain. <coughs> Uh, with interactive fountain and active frontage site. This is also a key pedestrian node in the site, a place for people socialize, shopping, walking, and passing. I have utilized the railway arches to increase permeability and arrange night lights on the railway arches to activate the area at night. Through the railway arches is the cent central courtyard. There is a large step platform facing the square for relaxing, socializing, and holding large events. A footbridge offering good views extend from high to low and ensure barrier-free access to the site. A large event low with large LED screen on the opposite building for people to watch open-air movies. Active frontage on both sides for shopping, dinnering, and coffee. I create a space for children to climb um, with the pedestrian, pedestrian bridge base. Then let's move to the Fagrand Garden. This is a, a quieter park with good connectivity and continuity with Central Courtyard, an accessible park full of multicolored flowers where the soul can be healed by the flowers. Poor trees and buildings can provide a good sense of enclosure. Then green space under the viaduct. I have retained the high quality green way under the original viaduct of the site. I also create more alternative path under the viaduct to reach the different building in the south. Uh, this is a sale region for the traveling days public realm from North Gateway to Fragment Garden. 
Uh, thirdly, uh, for historic building, Sackville Street building is the key one. I have returned this list building as a hotel lead building. It acts as a high rising building to be a landmark and attracting footfalls. It is also a good place to live and enjoy the key view of the Winton Park for visitors. It contributes to the character and the citizen's sense of place. Uh, another two listed building is Oriental House and the Granby House. Uh, since they are in good condition and the northern part of the site is mainly used for residential, so I keep them. However, I have some, I have demolished the Hollywood wall as it was not conductive to connection and poor contribution to the townscape. I also adopt a number of design strategies such as land use, sustainability, and green building design and safety design to make this place a healthy community. You can see them in my design details. Now you have two minutes. This is the central plaza. Central courtyard. Children can climb the wall here and there is a large green law. The footbridge the railway high street with active frontage, central courtyard, the view from the train. <clears throat> That's all, thank you. Tremendous, fabulous presentation, thank you so much.